in his will. We're going to talk about God's will. Now, what is, I believe that God actually wants to show us something. I believe that God actually wants to show us some things in, uh, in our lives. Can anybody tell me what they think the will of God is? What is the will of God? What is the will of God? Can somebody just maybe, what's your definition of the will of God? The word of God. Okay, the word of God. The word of God will actually reveal his will. Yes, it's hard. His plan for you. That's another good definition. God's plan for you. That is God's will. Remember this. The father always wants the best for his children. Anybody got children? Yes, sir. Anybody got children that are old children? <laughs> I'm talking to an older crowd. I'm probably got the youngest kids. So you got older children. They're still children, aren't they? Still taking care of them. So I guess it doesn't stop at 18, does it? But think about this. Don't you want the best for your children? And see, that's how God looks at us. He wants the best for us. So when we begin to wander, wander around from the center of his will, he actually acts. He does something to, some things to us. He acts to recapture our attention and to protect us from harm. Let me say that again. When we wander away from God's will, and all of us will do that at some point in our lives, what he does is, number one, he acts. Say acts. Mean, that means that he does something to us. Then also what he does is, he does this to recapture. Say recapture. Our attention. Say attention. And he protects us. Say protects. He protects us from harm. Aren't you glad God protects you from harm? Yes, yes. And he does that when we wander away from his will. So what we're talking about again is what God wants to show us is how to walk in his will. So remember this. If necessary, God will move heaven and earth. He'll move heaven and earth to show us his will. He'll do some drastic things. He'll do some real tough things for us to deal with in order for us to see what his will is. So never forget, he speaks directly to our hearts through what? The Holy Spirit. He speaks to our heart through the Holy Spirit, but also he has other ways to get our attention. And what I want you to find out today is what are the other ways that God uh, will use to get your attention. So how does God get our attention? I'm going to give you eight ways that God is going to get your attention. Eight ways that he's probably already done this in your life. I want you to remember this. Sink this in your head. You can get the DVDs later of this. If you want to get it later, you can write it down now. There's eight ways that he wants to show us what he wants for our lives, and he'll do this to get our attention. Number one, he'll give you a restless spirit. He'll give you a restless spirit. Have you ever been restless before? And it's not just about sleep. It's about you can't just, you really can't stand yourself in your situation. A restless spirit. Let's read Esther chapter 6, 1 through 10. Esther chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. We're going to talk about that restless spirit. Again, I have my keyword Bible. Some of this I'm going to go all the way through. Some I'm not because I have a lot of, uh, a lot of verses that uh, this is going to cover. But Esther chapter 6, 1 through 10, we're just going to look at some examples of how God gave, uh, uh, was showing people in the Bible different things in order to get them in his will. Esther verse 6, 1 through 10 says this, On the night could not the king sleep. The book of the Chronicles were read before the king, and I'm skipping through my keyword Bible, and was found written that Mordecai had told of Bithana and Teresh, who sought to lay hand on the king. And the king said, What honor? hath been done to Mordecai for this. Then said the king's servant, there was nothing done for him. And the king said, who was in the court? Now Haman was come to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai. So Haman came in and the king said, what shall be done unto the man whom the king delighted to honor? Now Haman thought to whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself. Mordecai had a what? He had a restless spirit. He had a restless spirit. He could not sleep. So how did God direct the king, uh, excuse me, the king had a restless spirit, not Mordecai. The king had a restless spirit. So the question is, how did God direct the king to honor Mordecai? What he did to him was he made, his, he made him restless. So sometimes when God wants you to do something, he'll make you restless. He'll make it where you can't, uh, uh, 
you can't function the way that you want to function. So if you experience inner restlessness connected to dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction with the status quo, first make sure that you're not ignoring an area of sin in your life. First make sure you're not going in the wrong direction. And we know a lot of times when we're kind of steering off in the wrong direction, when we're going in the area of sin that we need to get out of. First check that. Then ask the Lord in my restlessness, in me feeling this way, are you trying to tell me something? And see, God sometimes tries to tell you something through a restless spirit. So think about the last time you experienced a major life change. For instance, changing your jobs or moving to a new area of life, of Christian service, or deciding to do something new in your life, uh, changing uh, to just something new. Did God speak to you through restlessness? Did God speak to you through restlessness? Never forget that. Did God speak to you? through restlessness. Here's the next way that God will show you his will. This is what he'll do for you. He will give you a spoken word. A spoken word. Now God also gets our attention through the wisdom of others. See, a lot of times God will speak through people. God will speak through some wise people in our life. I always, in my life, I try to keep what I call wise consultants in my life. Now, I don't need a, a, a plumber when I need uh, something done uh, for somebody to paint my walls, though. And, and you'll get that a little bit later. You got to make sure you have the right people for the right situation. Some people can help you in some areas, and some people can help you in other areas. So you have to find the right consultants. So um, um, people are fit for a particular area of your life, and sometimes God will bring those people to you. Uh, let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Uh, verse 22 uh, talks about, um, I believe it's Eli. Eli received a message uh, from someone else about his situation. 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verse 22. And basically the, the story goes on through 22 through 36 and also 1 through 8. I'm going to kind of skip through so we can get the gist of this story of Eli and what was going on with Eli. The Bible says this, now Eli was very old and his sons lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle. And he said, I hear of your evil dealings. You make the Lord's people to transgress. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat him? They hearkened not unto their father. And Samuel grew and was in favor both with the Lord and men. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said, thus saith the Lord, did I appear into the house of thy father in Egypt? and chose him out of all the tribes to be my priest? And did I give thy father the offerings made by fire? And I'm in verse 29 now. Wherefore kick ye at my offering, and honorest thy sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the offerings of Israel? Wherefore I said, the house of thy father shall walk before me forever. But now I will cut off thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thy house forever. The increase of thy house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign that thy two sons in one day shall die. And I will raise up a fruitful priest. And he shall walk before mine anointed. And everyone left in thy house shall say, put me into one of the priest's offices that I may eat. Chapter 3 says this, and Samuel ministered before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious. There was no open vision. And when Eli laid down his eyes, began to wax dim that he could not see. And Samuel laid down to sleep that the Lord called Samuel. And he ran unto Eli and said, here I am. And he said, I called not. Eli said, I didn't call you. And the Lord called yet again. And Samuel went to Eli and said, this call me. And he answered, I called not. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord revealed unto him. And the Lord called again the third time, and Eli perceived that the Lord had called. Therefore Eli said, Go, lie down, and if he calls, say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord called as at other times. Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Number 11 says, And the Lord said, and I'm going to 12, I will perform against Eli things concerning his house. For I will judge his house for thy iniquity. His sons made, and he restrained them not. And Samuel opened the house of the Lord and feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel, What is this thing the Lord said unto thee? 
And then verse 18 says, and Samuel told him and hid nothing. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good. So this is a message that was given to Eli from two people. He received the message, number one, from the man of God. He also received the message from Samuel. What was the message? That your house, your sons, because of what they were acting up, you will not inherit the things that God wanted you to inherit. And so you had two people telling Eli what was going to happen in his life. He received a spoken word twice. So think about this. If, a, if a, a, a several people in a short span of time tell you the same thing, ask the Lord if he's speaking through them. For example, uh, sometimes a message at the church, you'll hear uh, the pastor preach a word, and then a friend's advice will sound very similar to that. A uh, good question. Think about this. Why do you think God often gives you the same message in several different ways? Tell me this. Why do you think God does that? Yeah, sometimes it takes more than one thing. Anybody ever asked for advice about four and five times? Yeah. You usually know the answer to the question, but you ask it a bunch of times. Yeah. Right, right. Shirley. My fear for a word is sister Owens. Okay. And Sister Owens, she, is she most of the time right? All the time. Where's Sister Owens at? I'm going to start asking Sister Owens too. <laughs> but Sister Owens, everyone has a Sister Owens in their life. Everyone has somebody that, that imparts wisdom in your life. And sometimes God can work through them. And a lot of times you can inherit it and figure out if that message is the right message when you hear it multiple times. That's a sign, hearing it multiple times. So think about it. Think about it in your own life. What has God been saying to you lately? What has God been saying to you lately? Here's another way. He'll give you what? Say this, an unusual blessing. Anybody want an unusual blessing? Sometimes God will speak to you through an unusual blessing. Uh, think about this. To get our attention, God may show his favor in some unexpected ways. you got to remember that God can show favor in your life in unexpected ways. What prompted, think about this, one Roman jailer to ask how could he be saved? Anybody know the story of Paul? Let's go to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 says this. Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 34. What prompted one Roman jailer to ask, how could he be saved? The Bible says this, starting in chapter 16, I'm kind of skipping through again, and a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of uh, divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and cried, these men are the servants of God. And this did she many days. But Paul turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus to come out. And he came out. And when her master saw the hope of their gains was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and brought them to the magistrates. And the magistrate and the multitudes rose up against, up together against them, up together against them. And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour that night and washed their stripes and was baptized. He and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the sergeant, saying, Let those men go. And the keeper of the prison told this, saying to Paul, the magistrates have sent to let you go, 
Now, therefore, depart and go in peace. Now, is that an unusual blessing? Think about it. That's an unusual blessing. And this situation prompted that Roland uh, jailer to be saved. So the jailer recognized the su that supernatural power of God was at work. And his experience prepared him to become a follower of Christ. And sometimes your experiences that you experience in life will prompt you and help you to become a good follower of Jesus Christ. God can also use things such as financial provision, the beauty of nature or, or the birth of a child to awaken people spiritually. God uses some unusual things in your life to awaken you spiritually, to help you to realize what he wants you to do. So here's a question for you. What type of blessings renew your desire to seek the Lord wholeheartedly? What type of blessings? What type of blessings has God blessed you with that cause you to renew your desire to seek the Lord wholeheartedly? Can somebody tell me? What kind of blessing? Yes, Lois. Illness, death, yes. Right, then it, it just sets you right back on pace. It puts you right where you need to be. Right here. Being saved from an accident. I, I, I witnessed an accident I'll never forget in college. I saw a young girl crossing the street, uh, crossing the place where we live, and I saw a car clip this girl right on the tip of her foot. A car, I mean, car going like 50, had to be 50 miles per hour. She was going across the street, just missed her. She's blessed. She should have been gone. Did you have something? I thought I saw him right there, him back. Right, right. Unusual blessing. Sometimes we have stability and, and resources when we probably shouldn't have it. Yeah, right, same thing. An unusual wife or husband. That's a good thing. That's a good thing, because a normal one, that usually only la marriage only lasts about a year. Go ahead. You got to have an unusual one, a good one, extraordinary. Someone that can stick with you in the good times or the bad times, that can deal with your craziness and everything else that everybody has going on. Right here. Right. We tried everything. We tried everything. He still blesses you in the midst of it. That's an unusual blessing. That's a good thing. Shirley. Okay. Prophetic events to be a part of what's going on in the world. Okay, let's go. What's the next one? Here's another way that God wants to put you in his will. This is going to be a tough one. Repeat after me. Say unanswered, unanswered. prayers. Anybody ever had an unanswered prayer? Oh my goodness, that's the tough one. God's supposed to answer every single prayer. Ain't you supposed to have a checklist and just wait for God to check it off? If you have a checklist, you'll find out that sometimes you're going to have some unanswered prayers. He will intentionally not answer your prayers. He will simply show you the, this word. The word is N-O. He'll put the no in your life, unfortunately. But fortunately, we're going to learn about that. Sometimes God will answer a prayer with no. Never forget, he may want to deal uh, first with sin or misplaced priorities. Sometimes we ask for things and our priorities aren't even in place. We ask for things what I call prematurely, before we need them, before we're ready for them. So sometimes he'll say no to deal with that. Sometimes he'll say no because he know we're not ready for it. If we're still stuck in a certain sin, how can he, how can he take you to that level when you're not ready for it? You don't, sometimes God will, don't want, won't want your cart to be before the horse. Sometimes he don't want you to be embarrassed. Sometimes he don't want you to have that yet because people will see this about you. So, so, so sometimes his no is a good thing. Or he may have something more important in store for us. Sometimes God says no to this little thing you want because he's got a big thing waiting on the other side. See, God is bigger than we think he is. So we ask so many things that aren't even enough for what he really wants for our lives. So never forget, I always say this, that God sometimes orders your stops. God sometimes orders the stops in your life. So, um, but also, um, uh, he'll say, you know, this is not for you. Uh, this is not 
uh, what you need to have. So what did the Lord eventually reveal to Paul about why he did not remove his thorn? Think about Paul and his thorn. Paul, go to uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, Paul had this thorn that was just messing with him his entire uh, life. His ministry was all, uh, uh, he had this thorn going on in his life. And there's many uh, theories on what the thorn actually was, but the, the bottom line is that the thorn was a bother to him. So sometimes you'll have some bothers in your life. Of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 and 10 says this, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. Repeat after me. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. For when I'm weak, when I don't get what I want, when I don't have what I want, when I don't have what I think I need, I'm strong. Why am I strong? Because God can still work for me even when I think I don't have all the resources. God can do some magical things in my life even when I don't think they can be done because I don't have what I think I need. At the end of the day, I can still be strong in my weakness. And that's what we're talking about here. He will sometimes say no, but don't worry about it. He knows what you need. And he knows where you need to go. Just think about an unanswered prayer from your life. Think about when God said no. I know God said no to somebody. If God said no to you, just say amen. amen. God said no to somebody. Uh, 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 think about this unanswered prayer in your life, uh, either one that was eventually fulfilled or that remains unanswered. Sometimes your prayer is still not answered. Um, uh, but think about this. What has he done for you through an unanswered prayer? Sometimes God blessed you even through that unanswered prayer. Somebody can say, God, I'm thankful that you didn't deliver this because I didn't know that this was going to happen to me. Right, right. Sometimes you want more. You want more in your plate, but you don't know. You about, you about to choke on those chicken bones. Go ahead. He knows your need. You think you know your need. God knows when you're ready for it. I'd rather be right than to not be ready. I tell you that. Because you can lose a lot of things. Right. Yeah. So glad. So glad I waited. So glad I waited. Never forget that. So, um, and, and, and the question is, the thing is, do you see any results from it? You see the results from waiting on the Lord. You see the results from him saying no in the midst of your situation. So here it is. What else does God want us to do? This person is looking into an empty box. Can somebody say, repeat after me, say disappointment. disappointment. This, this sign right here, this uh, picture says disappointed, the greatest gift of all. Now who thinks that disappointment is a gift? I know I don't. But again, God reveals his will sometimes. He will sometimes give you disappointment. I'm sorry to deliver the news. Sometimes God will disappoint you in order to get you in his will. When the nation of Israel refused God's command to take possession of the land, we talked about this in our Old Testament studies, they were judged for unbelief. Through disappointment, the Lord got their attention. Through disappointment, the Lord got their attention. So how were they punished for failing to trust God? They were actually punished. Numbers chapter 14. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14. How were they punished how were they punished for failing to trust God? Numbers chapter 14, verse 27. The Bible says this, Numbers 14, 27 through 32. It says, how long shall I bear with this evil congregation which murmur against me? I've heard the murmurings of the children of Israel which they murmur against me. Say unto them, as truly as I live, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken unto my ears, so will I do to you. 
your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you according to your whole number from 20 years old and upward which have murmured against me doubtless ye shall not come unto the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein save Caleb the son of Jephna and Joseph the son of Nun but you little ones which he said should be a prey them will I bring in and they shall know the land which ye have despised but as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years. So they were, they were punished. They were disappointed for failing to trust in God. Also, this list described the people's reaction when they heard what their punishment will be. Uh, stay in the same uh, chapter, Numbers 14, 39 through uh, 40, just two verses. And Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. They were disappointed and they rose up early in the morning and got them up in the top of the mountain saying, Lo, we be here and will go up unto the place which the Lord had promised, for we have sinned. So in a similar way, remember this, in a similar way, God may use setbacks uh, 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 to keep us from charting our own course. God uses setbacks to keep you from charting your own course. Remember this, setbacks... Uh, will basically set you, uh, 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 he gives you setbacks because he wants you to make sure that you are set up for his service. He wants to make sure that you are set up to be a servant of him and not a servant of someone else, not a servant of uh, material possessions, not a servant of others. We need to be a servant of God. So God will sometimes disappoint us because he wants to set us up to be able to learn to trust in him and follow him. Uh, can anybody think of a time when God disappointed you? When there was a disappointment in your life? When he put you in a situation, he put you in a bind that caused you to feel like, uh, uh, I'm just so disappointed by what happened in our life. Sometimes God is trying to show you what his will is for your life. And he's trying to do what? And let me tell you what he's trying to do. He's trying to draw you closer to him. Sometimes disappointment Sometimes these letdowns in your life, they draw you closer to God because sometimes you figure out, I can't lean on what I thought I could lean on. I don't know what I thought I knew. I thought I was so wise. I thought I had all this wisdom. I thought I had all this experience. But God showed me through this disappointment that at the end of the day, the only one that I need to put my trust in and depend on is God. Never forget that sometimes God will say no and sometimes God will disappoint you. So here's another thing God will do. Say circumstance. He will bring forth extraordinary, extraordinary circumstances. The Creator can use unusual phenomenon to get our attention, uh, to attract Moses. In the Bible, we talk about Moses. Everybody knows about Moses. God uses a burning bush that was not consumed by fire. That's, that's an unusual circumstance. A burning bush was used to give a message to, uh, to Moses that was not consumed by fire. And based on his reaction to the Lord's command, uh, let's answer this question. Why do we think God chose to get his attention this way instead of simply speaking to him? Except, instead of speak, uh, simply speaking to him. Let's go to Exodus chapter 4. Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 4 talks a little bit about Moses. Again, uh, God gave him this sign with this burning bush that was not consumed by fire. But then in Exodus chapter 4, 1 through 16, he does some other things. Instead of simply just saying to him, instead of just speaking in that voice, he did some other things. And Moses, and I'm going to skip through, and Moses said, but they will not believe me. For they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. Cast it to the ground. And it became a serpent. And Moses fled. And the Lord said, take it by the tail. He caught it, and it became a rod that they might believe that the Lord appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, Put now thine hand into thy bosom. And when he took it out, his hand was leprous. And he put his hand into his bosom again and turned again as his other flesh. Verse 9, If they will not believe these two signs, thou shalt take water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the river shall become blood. And Moses said, O oh my Lord, I'm not eloquent, but I am slow of speech. And the Lord said, Who hath made man's mouth? Have not I the Lord? I will teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O oh my Lord, send him whom thou wilt. 
And the angel, and excuse me, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. And he said, is not Aaron thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And he cometh to meet thee, and he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth. And I will be with thy mouth, and with his mouth I will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people. He shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of, the, of a mouth. And thou shalt be to him instead of God. Look at all those extraordinary circumstances in the in the life of Moses God will use extraordinary circumstances to get you in his will so think about this we must learn to look for the presence of God in our daily lives look for the presence of God in your daily lives he leaves footprints he leaves his handiwork and clues all around us God leaves clues for you all around the place think about what types of ordinary uh, circumstances extraordinary circumstances has the Lord used in your life anything extraordinary ever happened in your life God uses that extraordinary thing in your life to show you what he wants you to do to show you his will so another thing he'll do is he'll bring forth defeat say defeat He'll bring forth defeat. God may use defeat to show us the truth. Sometimes you got to lose in order to win. Sometimes you got to lose something in order to gain something. Sometimes you got to get pushed back about five steps to get pushed forward about ten. Remember that. Sometimes losing something teaches you to cherish what you have. Sometimes losing something teaches you to re realize what you actually had in your hand and what he actually had given you. But God can give it back, but you got to be in his what? His will. Sometimes defeat will break you down to the point where you learn to stand his will. Anybody ever been defeated so much you say, I'm not even going to step out of the Lord's will. Sometimes that's what he'll do. He'll keep defeating you. He'll keep saying no. He'll keep putting you in this position. You say, listen, I'm going to just go with the Lord because it's harder to do it the other way. And some of us are more stubborn than others. Some of us, it takes a little longer than others. But all the times we're going to come around and say, listen, it's easier to follow God even if I don't want it this way. So think about this. Uh, the Israelite army had this problem. Why did the Israelite army lose the battle of Ai? They lost that battle because they were what? They weren't doing what the Lord wanted them to do. They were sinning. They were, doing, they were going against his command. That's why they were losing that battle. So even defeat, so that's why they were defeated. And so even defeat can be a stepping stone to success when we pray this. You need to always pray this to the Lord. Say, Lord, what are you trying to say? Sometimes in your defeat, you need to talk to God and say, God, I think you may have a message for me. And since I'm defeated, since I'm back in this place, since I'm a little tired now, I'm a little restless, now I'm going to sit down and listen to you. Lord, what are you saying? Help me to see why I have taken the wrong turn. And that's what you've got to remember. Ask the Lord, help me to see. Help me, give me vision, give me foresight. Give me the wisdom to understand when you're talking to me. A lot of times you can be getting all these signs, but you don't realize that the Lord is talking to you. Even though I give you these eight steps, you can't realize a lot of these steps unless you ask the Lord to reveal what he's trying to say to you. Think about a time when you failed. Think about a time when you were defeated, uh, uh, when you lost a job, when you made a mistake, when uh, you ruined a relationship. How did the Father use that experience for your spiritual growth? A lot of times the Father uses those defeats for your spiritual growth. He will use defeat in your life to make you better. Aren't you glad God uses defeat sometimes to make you better? Because sometimes we won't hear him unless we defeat, unless we lose. But I tell you one thing, if you defeated that one time, you can become more than a conqueror if you follow God the next time. God can bounce you back. You got to remember that. He can bounce you back even from defeat. So here's uh, uh, the last one. He can bring you. This is what he's trying to do. Uh-oh, say this word. Say trouble. He can bring tragedy, sickness, and financial trouble in your life. Sometimes he'll bring trouble, sickness, financial problems in your life just to try to get you into his will. Just to try to show you what he wants for your life. Anybody ever experienced that in their life? A little trouble? A little sickness? Little uh, financial issues. You, you know, you want a little more in the account and it wasn't there. Sometimes he's trying to show you what his will is. We should regard our affliction as reasons to ask, ask the Lord once again, what are you trying to tell me? What was God's purpose? Uh, think about this in uh, Hezekiah's illness. Let's go to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Let's see what uh, was God's purpose in uh, Hezekiah's illness. 
2 Chronicles uh, chapter 32, chapter 32, verse 24. What was God's purpose? Hezekiah, you're sick. What was your purpose in making me sick? Hezekiah finally asked God after he's broken down, he does whatever he want to do, then that sickness comes. He said, okay, Lord, I'm ready to listen. 2 Chronicles 32, 24 says uh, this. The Bible says, uh, verse 24, in those days Hezekiah was sick to the death and prayed unto the Lord, and he spake unto him and gave him a sign. He gave him a sign. Remember that. He gave him a sign. God's purpose through his illness was to give him a sign, was to give him a sign. So why did the father allow the Midianites to devastate uh, his people's land? Uh, again, he wanted to show them that they were doing the wrong thing. Let's go to Judges chapter 6. Joshua Judges, Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6, verse 3 through 6. Says this, Judges 6, 3 through 6. Okay, it says this, And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up, and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even uh, they came up against them, and they came them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of the Lord cried unto the Lord. They were devastated because the Lord had to show them what was his will. So God wants to speak to us in the midst of hardship. Yes. So sometimes you got to take your hardship, what you're going through, as, as a vessel of, that God may be using to speak to you. Even if our troubles have no connection to sin, even if we're doing the right thing, he will impart new wisdom. He'll impart new wisdom in your life. He will show you how to overcome despite suffering. He'll show you how to overcome the spice suffering, or he'll give you fresh revelations about himself. God sometimes will give you fresh revelations about himself when you're going through tragedy, sickness, and financial troubles. Never forget that. So if you're facing adversity right now, ask the Lord, what does he want you to learn in this season? What does he want you to learn in this season? So this is what you do. You got to be three things. You got to be three things as I close to receive this. Now, we know what the eight things are that God can possibly use to, to speak to you, to show you his will. But this is what you got to be. Number one, you got to be humble. Say humble. humble. Since God is opposed to the proud, he calls out the humble to accomplish his purpose. He wants servants who seek him, who seek to give him the glory instead of taking the credit for themselves. That's what he needs. So number one, you got to be humble to receive that will. Number two, you got to be pure. Say pure. pure. Another requirement for effective service in God's will is a pure life. I'm not talking about perfection. If you're perfect, raise your hand because I want to know you. Okay? So I'm not talking about perfection, but I'm talking about uh, uh, having a heart that is bent toward obedience to God. Purity necessitates keeping short accounts with God through immediate confession and sincere repentance. Yes. So you are sincerely sorry for what you do. Allowing sin to remain in our lives hinders our usefulness because it deadens spiritual sensitivity and quenches the spirit's power. So you have to be humble. You got to be pure. And the third thing I don't want you to ever forget, and if you can do this, you can be in God's will and God can do some awesome things in your life. The third thing you got to be is available. Say available. Is there anybody in this place that can say, Lord, I'm available to you? God is looking for willing servants who make themselves available for whatever he asks you to do. Are you available for whatever he asks you to do? When the Lord called Isaiah, the prophet immediately responded this way. Never forget. And here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. Even though he hadn't yet heard the job description, Isaiah said, here I am, send me. I'm reminded of this story uh, that Jesus told in the Bible in Matthew chapter 25. The story goes to say that Jesus told a parable about a master who entrusted their servants with various amounts of money to invest on his behalf. Two of them went right to work and doubled that investment. 
But the third man simply dug a hole and hid that money. On returning, the master lavishly praised and rewarded the servants who had used what he'd given them. But the one who refused to serve him was severely punished. We won't lose our salvation because of lack of service or if we fight against his will, but we can lose rewards that God wants to give us. And what I'm trying to teach you today, if you're in the will of God, there's some rewards that God wants to give you. I don't care what you think, God wants to reward you. And there's some people that say, I don't need nothing, but there's things that God wants for you that you do need in your life. We can lose opportunities that God wants us to have. Think about this. We can lose success that God had right in the midst of your path. We can most importantly lose the reward that God has stored up for us in heaven. Don't you want your reward from heaven? Think about this. For not using for what God entrusted in your life here on earth. So stay in the will of God. Stay in the will of God and watch for the signs of God and watch how God wants to give you his best. God wants to give you opportunity. God wants to give you provision. God wants to give you help. God wants to give you strength. God wants to bless you. God wants to expand your territory. He wants to do some awesome things in your life. But he says one thing. He said, just stay in my will. Stay where I want you to stay. Go where I want you to go. Stop when I say stop. Do it when I say do it. You can get there when I say you're ready to get there. Stay in my will and you won't be stopped. There won't be weapons formed against you that will prosper. There won't be people that can stop you from getting to where I want to take you. Stay in my will. Stay in my way and watch what the Lord will do in your life. If you believe it, give God a hand clap of praise today. Let's stand today. Let's stand today. Let's prepare ourselves for offering. Prepare ourselves for offering. If you get along.